Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Drs. Mary Hockenberry Meyer and Natalie Bumgarner about the top 10 plants for increasing the awareness of plants. Why is it important for the public to be aware of plants? What sparked the creation and curation of these lists? What tips and tricks can others use to start lists of their own for their state or region? Answers to all these and more coming right up. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is part two of our series on plant blindness, or part three if you're going by episode numbers. But uh, today we have Natalie and Mary with us. Natalie Bumgarner is the University of Tennessee Residential and Consumer Extension Specialist with responsibilities for educational content development and programming across Tennessee, as well as the statewide coordinator for the Tennessee Extension Master Gardener Program. She completed her bachelor's and master's from West Virginia University and her Ph.D. from Ohio State University and undertook postdoctoral work at the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center in Wooster, Ohio. Mary joined the University of Minnesota Horticultural Science faculty in 1994 and works in extension, teaching, and research. She manages the North American Plant Collections Consortium Ornamental Grass Collection at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, which was first planted in 1987. Mary works with several extension educators to coordinate statewide multimedia educational programs in environmental and consumer and commercial horticulture, and is also an author, including as a co-author on The Ten Plants That Changed Minnesota. We'll have links to those books in the show notes. Welcome to the show, Mary and Natalie. How are you both doing today? Great. Good to be here. Yeah, doing well. We're excited to share about this project. Awesome. So glad to have you. So, uh, as I mentioned before, this is part two on our plant blindness series. So, for those who haven't listened to the first part yet, first of all, please do go back and listen. It was a blast. But plant blindness is basically the idea that people are not good at seeing the plants that are around them. They just don't really notice that they're there, don't notice many differences about them. But I'd like to start off by just asking you guys first a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day basis in your positions and how plant blindness impacts what you do. Okay, this is Mary. I'll go first. Um, I teach at the University of Minnesota, uh, graduate students and undergraduates, and um, I am still finding there are a lot of people who don't know what plant blindness is, or even if they personally might have plant blindness. So I think there's um, a lack of awareness about what plant blindness is, although I will say that there there are many young people who love plants today, especially house plants, so that's great. Uh, This is Natalie. So I'm an extension specialist, and I get to work all over the state of Tennessee. And my area of work is really just to educate on a broad range of horticultural production practices. And for me, I think that what I see is is actually similar to what Mary was saying, in that we kind of have a dichotomy. We have a uh, interested population that's very much engaged with plants. And then we have a large percentage of the population, which, you know, in increasing the urbanizing environment, have little understanding about how much plants really impact the ecology, environmental stewardship, uh, let alone agricultural production and the research that we do as land grant universities. And can you explain just for people who don't work in these fields, what is extension and what does that do? <laughs> well, that's a great question, and uh, and I think probably it's common for it to be a vague concept. So essentially, as land grants, our role in that um, in those unique universities is to educate students for uh, future agricultural careers, um, to do research on agriculture uh, production, and um, and those kinds of topics. And then extension is that branch that takes all that information to mineral members of the general public. So it um, it's non-credit education. And so I get to travel and work with, um, with our county folks, right? So the cool thing about Extension is that we have a strong county presence with uh, agents. That's what we call them in the 
uh, southeast, maybe educators in other parts of the country who work with producers and citizens in their county to answer questions on everything from pests, diseases, food safety, home gardening, and, uh, and a range of production agriculture. So it's the way that we take the agricultural research knowledge to every member of our community. Nice. So now that we've got kind of a bit of a background on both you ladies and this issue, I was hoping to talk about this overarching effort that both of you were involved in in your respective states. Mary, that's obviously Minnesota for you and Tennessee for you, Natalie. But it was kind of this initiative to develop this list of the top 10 plants that have changed your state over time. So can you just tell me about how how did all of this get started? What really birthed this effort? Well, uh, I was on sabbatical one year. This is Mary, and I read the book by Bill Laws, 50 Plants That Changed the Course of History, I think is the name, or 50 Plants That Changed the World, something like that. And he has wrote a very broad-ranging worldwide look at plants that have made a big impact on people since the dawn of time. It's really historical and uh, worldwide. A lot of tropical plants on tea and coffee and things like that are in this book. And I was thinking about Minnesota and, and more locally what plants had made a difference. And along with this plant blindness, people are not seeing plants around them and the importance of plants in our states that I got the idea of thinking, well, what are what plants have really made a difference in Minnesota? How would the, we identify these plants? And when I talked to my colleagues at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, part of the University of Minnesota, they... Uh, thought this was a really intriguing idea and thought that engaging the public and actually nominating the plants, letting the public have a a say in picking the plants, was a way to start looking at uh, this issue and to try to alleviate plant blindness and to um, be an educational program as well. So that's that's how we started it. And then we did open up a public nomination process for about three months. Uh, there was a website, on a link on the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum website where you could nominate very quickly one plant. Uh, you could nominate as many as you wanted. And we asked people, uh, you know, name the plant, and then why are you nominating this plant? And um, with the wonders of technology, all of that information went into a spreadsheet form that then we could look at and organize. And so in three months, we had over uh, 500 nominations of individual plants. Wow. And uh, Natalie, you had a, a similar program. Can you tell us how you got started? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is kind of the the beauty of collegiality, right? So um, Mary told you the introduction uh, about Minnesota. And in Tennessee, uh, one of my colleagues was at a conference. Uh, He's primarily a teaching faculty, and he saw a presentation that Mary gave, and he came back and said, we need to do this in Tennessee. And so the cool thing about the way that Extension and land-grant colleagues work is we just called Mary up and we said, hey, this is a great program. We would like to do it in our state. And she was kind and accommodating and generous with information. And we did a very similar process to what they did in Minnesota in putting up a nomination system, collecting all of those, and getting then a group of our colleagues across the Institute of Agriculture here uh, to help us as a panel to select from those nominations. Yeah, I really wanted to dive in a little bit deeper on that selection process that you talked about. So you guys actually set up some guidelines to really help people with this nomination process. I know, Mary, you kind of split your nominations a little bit uh, for teachers as well. But can you tell me what you had some categories in there that people could pick and choose from? to help justify why they thought the plants were important so they weren't just like 
apples and then no other information. Can you tell me about what those categories were, how you picked those, uh, maybe some examples of the kinds of things that would go into those categories? Yes, so we had six categories um, or criteria for nominations, and we did ask the public to select which of these does your plant apply to, and then we had an other category where they could add additional information. But the categories we suggested were environmental impact, economic or industrial, cultural or spiritual, historical, sustenance uh, or food, and then landscape. So those are the ones we had. I think, Natalie, you had a couple more, or you defined yours a little bit differently. Yeah, we tweaked some of the uh, descriptions just a little bit, but they followed yours really closely. And so this is the criteria that we had in mind for the public to think about. So when you think about the economic impact in Minnesota of corn and soybeans, uh, that's a very big deal with many people in, involved with production of corn and soybeans. So people could realize, hopefully, wh what we were thinking about. But by the same token, we did get some very different and unique nominations. So we had people nominate cutie oranges, we had rhubarb, we had very invasive plants like buckthorn for Minnesota, we had dandelions. So, uh, we, you know, people, people had their favorites. We did have people that lobbied us extensively for their um, plants. The Hosta Society in Minnesota was very eager to to get hosta on the list. And although hosta are wonderful plants that grow well in Minnesota, they really didn't come to the top in any of these um, categories. Whereas the Corn Growers Association, uh, they were a very, they're a very uh, a big group and they uh, sent us extensive information with facts and figures about corn historically in Minnesota and why um, it had made such a big difference. Yeah, that was a that was a really interesting part of your paper was just getting to see how that nomination process worked and some of those, you know, adorable <laughs> submissions and 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 really just the effort that that people would put into that to have cited papers or, you know, references in there. So we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, maybe that process tied in to the plant blindness issue at large in a little bit here. But I also wanted to talk about another thing that you mentioned earlier, Natalie, was this panel of judges. So first of all, can you just kind of explain who got to be on the panel, how you made those decisions, and also... Uh, how how did were any of these categories more weighted? I mean, I think if you ask the average person, they would be like, oh, well, like food plants are more important than, you know, decorative plants. But but I think your project was really, you know, kind of targeted to be like, well, they're all important because plants are great. <laughs> so was there anything that kind of maybe would affect how plants were judged? Uh, any Anything like that? Um, I, w I guess uh, to simply explain a little bit about how we use the panel was to make sure that we were balancing those different criteria. And Mary explained the, the different categories, and I think that, that helped in our nomination process to make sure that we just weren't getting solely the main list of all of the uh, farm gate receipt highest crops in the state but to provide people context, you know, think about culture, think about the populations that lived here before uh, we did. And then that panel kind of helped us make sure that we weren't necessarily waiting the last 50 years higher than the thousands of years that occurred before that. And so we had uh, the folks who myself and my colleague who were kind of running this process are primarily production horticulturists. So we wanted to make sure that on that panel, we got some of our agronomy folks. Um, we had um, people who worked with, you know, tobacco and some of those other crops. We had forestry and wildlife folks who, you know, would speak more towards tree and grass species. And so our goal was to make sure that we balanced 
that perspective in in the process. Sure. Yeah. Um, you brought up uh, kind of this cool tie in between kind of these experts and the public and and that balance that that brought. And one of the things that I was really impressed by when I was reading this paper was just all of the different groups that uh, both of you worked with. But can you just tell me, how, how did you coordinate that? Obviously, as Extension, you know, people who develop these educational programs, it's, you know, it's part of your job. But how, how do you go about that? And how do you make those connections? Well, actually, I, I can answer that. Uh, this is Mary. We found that the media was really interested in this project. Uh, when we had the nominations originally, the media really picked up on this. And so the media helped us to promote the nomination process and what are the 10 plants. And that connected us with a lot of the different people in the industry and industry groups, like the soybean growers, the corn growers, the wheat growers, and so on. And these uh, folks in Minnesota did support our program financially and helped us to produce educational content and to get the content out to uh, teachers in the schools that we were interested in reaching. So I think the media really helped us to uh, get the word out. And it was really fun to for the media and myself to go on um, the television stations in Minnesota and say, you know, what What do you think the 10 plants are? And then as soon as the nomination process was complete and we had selected them, the media ran a lot of articles as well uh, about, can you guess the 10 plants? Do you know what they are? And so on. So the whole idea of the what are the top 10 and can you name them? That still is a very intriguing idea for uh, for the public, and, and I still do, I'm sure Natalie does uh, talks on what are the 10 plants and how how were they nominated and can you guess them and do you know why we picked them? So um, it it was a popular media idea, and I think from, from our viewpoint in Minnesota, that helped us connect with a lot of people. I think it kind of speaks to a smart way to handle some of these projects is you know, people like lists. <laughs> like they just, if you challenge people of just like, can you name the top 10, you know, movies from the 80s or pop hits from the 90s? I mean, people just go wild for lists. So I thought that was also just a really cool way to go about that as well. Yeah, people do like lists and it kind of makes a game out of it and a challenge with can you name them? I tell people if you're having if you're having a dinner party tonight, this is, you know, this is how to stump your friends, ask them what the plants are and then give them a way to to remember them. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Mary and Natalie's article, Top 10 Plants Increasing Awareness of Plants, published in Crop Science as part of their special section on connecting agriculture, public gardens, and science, is always freely available. You can find a link to it in our show notes. If you're a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, there are continuing education units available for this episode. You can find a link to it on certifiedcropadvisor.org or our show notes. Let's get back to the show. This actually transitions pretty well into our next section here, which is uh, just to go over what those 10 plants are. So can you just give us a, a high-level overview of these plants uh, maybe why they were picked or what category they belong to. And if there's any that are like a personal favorite of yours, maybe you tell us about that. Sure. So the three, the 10 in Minnesota, the three A's, alfalfa, American elm, and apples. Uh, I certainly am a fan of apples, and that was the number one 
nomination from the public. Uh, then we have uh, the three W's, which are wheat, white pine, and wild rice. And wild rice in Minnesota has a long, long history because of that's it's uniquely produced in Minnesota. It's a native plant, and the Native Americans, uh, that's a spiritual and very much uh, cultural plant, part of their heritage. So a lot of people do guess that plant. Uh, corn and soybeans, uh, those the big, huge, big crops. Most people guess those. Lawns, uh, we did that because the geographic area they cover. And the last one, um, purple loose drive. So purple loose drive is people say, well, why'd you pick that bad plant? This is the invasive plant, the poster child. It's now biologically controlled with beetles in Minnesota. We don't use pesticides against it anymore. It no longer is increasing. It, it's a minimal issue where it was a major invasive plant that we had to uh, statewide the Department of Natural Resources was spending a lot of money to control it. It's now um, under control. So that's kind of a snapshot of Minnesota's top 10. Sure. And Natalie, what about Tennessee? Yeah, yeah. So uh, from Tennessee, oftentimes when I talk about them, I try to group them sort of in content areas or in areas of impact. And so not surprisingly, we start off our list with some of our key agricultural crops. So we have corn, cotton, and tobacco. And even just among that list, it kind of illustrates the very wide agricultural diversity of Tennessee from, you know, the eastern mountains where historically uh, burley tobacco has been a really important crop, the key constituent of uh, Marlboro Reds, um, to west Tennessee, which agriculturally is very much like Arkansas or, you know, some parts of uh, Oklahoma, you know, and so um, we have we have that diversity. Corn, and I was bigger crop as it used to be, but in the 1800s, you know, as Tennessee was the edge of the agricultural frontier, big crop. Uh, then we move into um, some crops that have some historical and current production significance. Beans was one that we kind of brokered a deal and split the difference on because um, we have a lot of Native Americans who have grown beans in the state of Tennessee for a long time. And over the last 50 years, soybean has become what is now our number one farm grade crop. So we put the beans together and we also included grasses. I want to be careful here because we have a, a native grass expert here. And so once again, we kind of tried to cover that spectrum, recognizing that right now, you know, uh, fescue and the importance of that crop to our beef cattle industry is very important. But if we look back uh, there have been some grassland ecologies in parts of Tennessee that may be even more diverse than some of our uh, eastern deciduous forests. Um, we have dogwood, which is a crop that is indicative of the horticulture industry in Tennessee. We have a lot of nurseries, and dogwood is one of our largest crops. In fact, I think there's a, probably as many dogwoods in Tennessee as there are in almost every other uh, state put together, a lot of young ones. Um, kudzu, I already kind of mentioned as our invasive. And then we have three crops that kind of represent our forest uh, crops. And so we have white oak, which is a strong economic um, production area right now. Tennessee is actually a pretty big uh, forestry state. Uh, we have American chestnut, which is in a similar way, Mary was talking about the, um, the American elm and some of the ways that dealing with pest and disease and, um, and invasive species has come into play. So um, the American chestnut and the way it was devastated by uh, disease, but now we're working to try to address that genetically. And then I ended, I guess, with one of my personal favorites, which was maybe the surprise on the list, and that is American ginseng. And so we kind of end with a crop that from Native Americans to early settlers to Appalachian uh, harvest in really poor economic times, we kind of have this crop that has a unique connection uh, to the Appalachian culture in East Tennessee. So that's our list. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's fun listening to this because, I, I mean, obviously I don't live in either of your states, so it's just kind of nice to get a high-level overview. So I'd like to maybe take a little bit of a step back here. So we've gone over how this program was developed, how you worked with those key partners, and what your results were as far as developing this list. But 
you also created a lot of resources out of this and see really an ongoing impact from this work. So can you talk about the different resources that you created? Uh, Mary, you wrote a really awesome book, but we'll, we'll save that one maybe for last. But what else did you create out of this? Well, we did make a website that people can go to see Top 10 Plants MN that have resources. Predominantly, we were interested in teachers and giving teachers this information so that they could use that with students. We did early on in the program, after the plants were nominated, we had a contest for kids to use the 10 plants in uh, some type of an educational game that they would make. And this was back in 2012, 2013. But several um, advanced high school students used technology and made games. And those games are linked, like the game of Jeopardy up there with the 10 plants. Those games are linked at the uh, top 10 Plants MN website. And then we developed uh, resources for master gardeners to be able to teach about the top 10 plants, uh, a slide set that we developed for them so that they could talk uh, in their communities as well. Then we developed uh, teaching uh, aids or teaching activities for uh, teachers. And uh, the book, as you mentioned, we did write a book, but the uh, information with the teach teacher's activities is available online. Uh, that can be printed off. It's 71 pages, but it can be printed off uh, or um, there's a link there where I can send people, send teachers uh, copies of those activities. So in Tennessee, and you probably kind of see by the dates that uh, Mary has a very mature program in Minnesota, and so ours is much younger, and we're at the early stages of working on some of those materials. Um, and I think that the key area that we focus on so far is lesson plans for teachers that integrate with the teaching standards for Tennessee. So we're collaborating with one of our 4-H specialists who also you know, deals a lot with in-school curriculum. And so we're really close to finishing out uh, lesson plan series that has um, across a few kind of middle school uh, grade levels lessons that address teaching standards from math to uh, social studies to sciences and even some writing so that there's a good cross section there that we can connect um, all of these plants with history, with culture, and providing that resource for teachers so that we want that to be used in classrooms, whether by 4-H agents or by teachers, and um, and so that's kind of that's kind of our big push right now. We have dreams of writing a book, but um, but we're one step at a time. Totally, yeah. Uh, chase those dreams; you can do it. Um, but I do want to talk about this book. Um, so you actually sent me a copy of the book. Thank you for doing that. That's oh, you're very welcome. generous. Yeah. Uh, I was so jazzed to get it. I'll admit I haven't had time to go through the whole thing, but even just flipping through, I think I ended up opening up to the Loose Strife page. But, I mean, the whole book is beautiful. The production of it is just re it's really well laid out. There's lots of pictures. And even just I think I read maybe like a couple of pages just flipping to the Loose Strife page and just browsing that right off the bat. And I was like, wow, I instantly learned like a ton of information. So it really is um, – an extremely useful resource. Um, I look forward to digging into it more uh, in future. But can you just tell me, uh, I know there's a co-author on this book. What what was that experience like? What are some of the benefits you've seen or, or maybe impact you've seen of the book so far? Just tell me a little bit more about that process. Yes, well, we I had a wonderful co-author, Susan Davis Price. Susan has written uh, other books, and she loves gardening. She's a retired librarian. She's just a great person to work with. She had worked extensively with the Minnesota Historical Society. And so when we approached the Historical Society Press about publishing this, they, they were quite excited. The Historical Society in Minnesota also has a huge archive of photographs and m many other things. They, we have a beautiful uh, museum here with the Historical Society. 
but their archives and photographs were such a resource, and many of those um, are, are in the book, and we use those. And then we had a great editor who really uh, did a, a wonderful job with blowing up the pictures. I mean, the pictures in the book are big. I was worried that things were going to look like a postage stamp, and we talked about that, but I never really saw how big and nice the photos would be until um, I got the galley proofs for the book. And then uh, they did. the editor also did some nice things with... Um, at the beginning, or is at the end of each chapter, they have fun facts about the 10 plants. So you can quickly look at that and see, you know, soybeans are made into crayons and white pine is used for popsicle sticks and things like that. So uh, it was it was really uh, a fun uh, thing to work on the book. And then uh, once the book was um, published... I think it was shortly shortly after the book was published, I approached a couple of uh, private donors about um, funding the book so that we could give it to uh, science teachers, biological science teachers in the state. And we received uh, money to do that so that we could distribute the book. So far, we've distributed about 350 books to science teachers across the state. This is in Minnesota, it's 7th and 10th grade, where botany or, or plants are really the, the focus with the objectives for the state and learning objectives. And so that uh, book, along with the teachers' activities that we had developed, we've been able to give that directly to teachers in the state. So it's been a great resource, and hopefully... Um, a lot of teachers have been able to use it as well. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful book. It's a great it's a great resource. Um, I didn't know those fun facts that you just listed even just now. So still still learning, constantly learning. Um, but yeah, that's that's a what a cool thing to get to do. What what a delight and and cool just to see you know, how far reaching this initiative ha has gotten. It's it's really cool. So then moving on, I guess the next thing I want to talk about is one of the things that, that you mention in your paper is just that it would be awesome if all states had these. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what, what do you see as a, just generally, what what are the future research needs or areas of growth for for addressing things like plant blindness, as as well as uh, what are what are some tips that you have for people who want to develop those programs? As obviously one area of growth would be you know the other forty eight states. When I think about what some of the um, needs are for the future, it's funny, we, we were actually, I just came from a faculty meeting and we were talking about this concept of ag literacy and communication and how we're good at getting the numbers, but we're not really good at, at sharing. And I think that one of the cool things about this project for me and why I would like to see it expand more is because it's kind of us as agriculturists or as plant scientists, as, as botanists kind of taking on the task of sharing why plants are are important. I think that sometimes we're guilty of, you know, sitting in our positions, working hard and doing what, what we're good at and what we're trained at and lamenting the fact that people just don't appreciate it. You know, they just don't understand what I do. Well, that's our job to tell them why it matters. And I think that this is an approachable and engaging and a fun way to, in a positive manner, communicate why it matters. Yeah, well said, uh, Natalie. You know, I think that some people, Abby, might be intimidated to think of, oh, this program is a big program. It's, you know, I'll look at all this stuff, look at all this work. But it doesn't have to be a big, intimidating program. The idea of the public nominations was a really simple thing, and the media loved it. So I would encourage colleagues to think about um, working with a botanic garden or a public garden that's near you because this is the, a better interface sometimes than our universities are with actually the public and engaging the public and work with a botanic garden or individually that you could certainly do that too to have the public nominate the 10 plants um, 
nominating and deciding on the 10 plants is is kind of the gateway to get you started. And then you can do a lot of other fun things with that. You can have classes with the public botanic garden. You could teach a, a class at the university is a bigger thing. We actually did that with our freshman seminar at the University of Minnesota. And students loved students were engaged by the topic what are the 10 plants so there's some you can do some initial steps and you don't have to do a a huge big program but we actually found that the program kind of gained momentum and built on itself as it went along more people suggested things people offered to do things and um, it it built on itself I think one of the great things that Mary helped us with as we started to develop the plans in Tennessee was just say, look, this is a multi-year process. I don't feel like you have to get it all done, come up with the nomination process, select, and then work from there to figure your outreach goals and just build. Yeah, it, se- it seems like it would build on itself pretty well. I mean, even even the fact that, that Natalie, your program basically started because you had Mary's program to look at. So we now have two potential templates for, for people to model uh, their program after. And, and the paper that you guys wrote really does go into some pretty good details about how to actually go about that, different groups to contact, people to work with. So those are some really uh, great pieces of advice. So I've got uh, three more questions for you guys. We talked a lot about some of the resources that are available. We will have additional links to extra resources in the show notes as well. But if you had to point to maybe just one or two key resources for people who want to learn more about these initiatives or plant blindness in general, where would you point them? You know, I do think that the paper uh, in Crop Science really summarized the whole thing. And that kind of is uh, a nutshell about how we went about the program, how it was developed, and so on. And then I think the website, the top10plantsmn.org, that's where each of the plants are. I mean, that's all the that's content about wild rice and what it is, et cetera, things like that. But it really doesn't tell you up there much about the program. There's a little bit about it, but nowhere near as much as, as what's in the, the crop science article. Yeah, I would agree. The process is, is largely um, in our paper. And then our, our websites have information about uh, those crops and how we that kind of connected with our state. One other um, fun thing that we have on our plant sciences YouTube page, and I can get you the link for that, is following this effort. And as we were releasing, we have some fun little snapshots from our specialists that work in corn or cotton or soybeans or um, some of those other areas. So it allowed us to connect with a lot of other departments around campus to say, hey, in 45 seconds, explain why people should care about your crop. And so it kind of brought a little bit of that academic research perspective to share with the publicity that we were putting out. Yeah, those are some great resources. I think also just the crop science special section that you guys are a part of is chock full of great information on similar programs, working with these different partners and groups. Uh, Also, just working... uh, Getting information from extension specialists like you guys would probably come to mind as a great resource if people have questions. Uh, My second question for you guys right now is if people want to get involved with these efforts, how can they go about doing that? Well, one one way that comes to mind is uh, become a master gardener. You know, that's that's kind of a maybe a big jump for a lot of people, but I I would consider uh, people looking into that because if you become a master gardener, you learn you find out what's going on in extension. You learn the extension resources, the extension people, and so on. So that's one way. Another way is um, in finding out about educational programs at a botanic or public garden near you or the continuing education classes that your university might have. So there, usually there, you can get on email lists, or become a member, uh, learn about uh, educational programs uh, that way. Excellent. And did you have any other suggestions about how people can get involved, Natalie? 
Oh, I, I think that, that Mary definitely hit on it through our extension programs like Master Gardener. And, and I also think that there's some, some fun opportunities with uh, the Botanic Gardens and the Public Gardens that are now doing some plant wild relatives types of work. And so it's not just ornamentals. A lot of what's taking place at our Botanic Gardens is connecting to, um, to the broad range of plant communities. Perfect. All right. Final question for you guys then. What is one fun fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? Um, okay, so I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to bounce back to the, the plant blindness theme. And I'm going to say, um, I think I'll probably say because my family won't listen to this, but I've actually been dealing with plant blindness since way before I knew what I meant because I grew up on a, a cattle farm. Um, and so one of my favorite words in the um, in the in the plant blindness original uh, paper was the word uh, zoo chauvinism. <laughs> and so I feel like that's part of my personal passion for this project is the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's our job as ambassadors to, um, to really get out the, uh, the, the plant love. So, um, so that, so that's my fun fact. Um, I've, I've been dealing with plant blindness for over 30 years now, and uh, I'm going to keep fighting the good fight. So I have an orange tree that was my grandmother's. It's a calamondin. So that's a little orange. It's kind of a weedy orange, but it's an indoor house plant. It probably has 200 oranges on it right now. It's 60 years old. Oh my gosh. That yeah. is the funnest fact. I had no idea you could even have them as just a little house plant, let alone with that much fruit on it. Yeah. Well, a calamondin is a is a little weedy orange. It's an orange that's only about one to two inches in diameter. It's quite bitter, but I use it to make marmalade. So my grandkids within the next week are going to be picking oranges in Minnesota. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Plant mentorship in action. There you go. Oh, they sound so cute. I'm going to have to look that up for sure. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all of your efforts for science and the, your community. Thank you, Abby. Thanks for doing the show. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe. And don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.